Can you feel the excitement here? We're at the first annual Santa Cruz Industrial Hemp Expo. And what we have here is over 85 vendors representing six countries and more than 15 states. We also have a hemp house, a fashion show, and foods of all kinds, as well as over 40 speakers. What we've done is we've brought together the wide array of possibilities of industrial hemp. Well, I'm really enjoying walking around here and looking at all the wonderful creative products that have been created using hemp. It's just quite astonishing. And it's, um, it's really encouraging because I see some real alternatives to the way in which we do things now that would be environmentally more sound and might help us move toward that sustainable future. The reason I'm most fascinated and impressed with hemp is that it's got such environmental importance in terms of uh, reducing water and air pollution, in terms of building soil and preventing erosion, in terms of saving the forests by replacing as an alternative uh, fiber for timber and so forth. And so the fact that all of these things can be benefits to be gained while producing a versatile and highly productive crop means that the people of California can create jobs, business opportunities, and restore industry to the state with a product that has been used for tens of thousands of years that draws upon our creativity, that solves our environmental problems, and that benefits society. So I'd say hemp is here for good. And we're here to uh, educate, as always, uh, the great public on the 50,000 consumer items that can come from cannabis sativa and just about everything in your house except glass and steel including rubber and plastics it can be spun with wool with cotton it can um, make all of our carpets it can make our particle board everything is usable in this plant and I did an educational display showing the uh, historical credibility of the plant uh, basically showing stuff like it's you know the first cultivated fiber crop ever uh, our forefathers planted it. Henry Ford built a car out of hemp. Hemp was a, uh, the premier agricultural crop in the 1800s, things like that. It's, it's got to be it's got to be shown that this crop has had historical credibility and that uh, because of its historical credibility it will in fact be um, a widely used um, future crop because of, its, because of its strength, because of its qualities. Um, I just think it's an amazing plan. I had a pleasure uh, doing this display. It was probably the best thing I've ever done in my life. I researched the history of hemp. There's a very vast and detailed history of hemp in the United States, especially in the eastern seaboard up in the Boston area where sailing was a very important part of the history. And I'm trying to, to reincorporate hemp into America's economy. And I do that by hemp, using Hemp Magazine as a tool to educate the people and to talk about it and to get people to write articles about hemp and to learn more about it. And one of the things that I'm holding here in my hand is a very unique piece of uh, hemp shingle roofing. It's kind of like shake shingle. It's about 40% hemp, uh, has polymers in it. Uh, very, seems very durable. 
Uh, you can see it uh, pliable. It's got a thin edge, thick on the side, roughly about 18 inches to two foot long. This uh, roof in here is going to be put on the hemp house in uh, um, Pine Ridge, South Dakota, uh, the Indian Reservation. This is kind of like a, a hemp creek, so to speak. It's got uh, hemp fibers in it. You can see them protruding out the side of the block here. Uh, this block is used to uh, build the house at uh, Pine Ridge. It's very heavy, it seems very durable. I think one of the most unique things we have here in the museum is a piece of material here. It's an armrest for Chevrolet Lumina. It's a 30% uh, hemp fiber with a 70% polypropylene. It's melted in and pressed. And it's pressed from a substance of this right here, a little mat. Uh, this mat is spread out and it's pressed into it. This product right here is ground up hemp herds which it comes from the center part of the hemp stalk. This flower was used in 1930s, the late 1930s, to make cellophane plastic, which at some 60 years, some 60 years later, uh, there's some people, it's entrepreneurial, that are making plastics from this product and are very good at it, such as the Frisbee we have here. This Frisbee is about 40% hemp cellulose plastic, other is polymers. Bio diesel fuel is made from hemp oil. It's very, it, you can refine it readily. We have burnt this in tractors, uh, 1961 two-cylinder diesel tractor, and it smelled like vegetable oil. Hemp oil in its painting covers evenly and it doesn't bubble up and blister like your everyday pants, paints do today because of the fossil fuel oils and the chemical bases that's used in it, causes them to bubble up under the sun. By this being a natural paint and a natural oil and the base for a paint, then this oil, this paint will stay on wood a lot better than an oil-based uh, uh, today's paint. This product here is ground up hemp stalks. It's ground up through the tornado pulper. This was done at North Carolina State University and at the Herdy Foundation in Savannah, Georgia. This product right here is uh, the first step process to making paper from whole stalk out of hemp stalks. When we started this company, again, we, we weren't really trying to make a hemp company. We were trying to make an eco company. We wanted to have zero waste. We wanted to be totally accountable for the product from the beginning of each processing of the materials to the end of the product's life. And to do that, we had to make sure that there were not any petrochemicals, no nylons, no nothing in any of the materials. So natural, in fact, that you could actually compost it, that you could just leave it in your garden and eventually the biomass would return to the earth. We take TerraPak scrap fabric, like this over here, and we recycle it into very high quality paper. Paper has been made from plant fibers like hemp for thousands of years. We've only been using trees for 150 years. And now there are virtually no trees left, so it's time to get back to plant fibers. 150 years ago, when people proposed that it was possible to make paper out of wood chips, everybody laughed and said, well, nonsense. You make paper out of rags, hemp and linen and cotton. You don't make paper out of wood. This is crazy. Wood chips are very low in cellulose. There's only about 30% cellulose in wood chips, which is the uh, basic material of paper. Hemp, on the other hand, um, is about 70% cellulose. So right away, uh, you can see that uh, quite a bit less toxic processing is going to be required for the hemp as for the, uh, the wood chips. Uh, the hemp is way better suited for paper. It's really astonishing to me as a paper maker to, to think that um, the commercial industry makes paper out of, uh, out of wood. It's the last material you want to use. It's almost a joke. The traditional quotation from uh, Bulletin 404 from the USDA in 1916 is that you can get over four times as much uh, pulp from an acre of uh, hemp as you can from an acre of trees on a sustained yield basis. When you harvest the trees, you get a lot of pulp. But when you consider that you get the pulp from the hemp year after year after year, uh, when you average it all out, you get at least four times as much uh, pulp from the hemp. I'm very much interested in alternative fibers because uh, half of the trees that are cut down are chipped up for pulp for paper and then um, half of our landfills are paper products. So what this means is that uh, we're just 
turning our ancient forest into landfill as fast as we can. This is really foolish because there's a, a much better alternative. We know that in this half of the century, the paper usage has gone up by a factor of six. The timber usage has gone up by a factor of three. We know that there is a, a fiber shortage in the world now and that it is getting worse. Our need for fiber in the world is not decreasing. The computer revolution has not given us a paperless society. It's too easy to hit the print button. Everyone's using paper and we're using it more and more. So we need more fiber. A fiber source like this particular plant that's so important that can be grown in rotation with corn and soybeans and alfalfa where we are now paying farmers not to grow anything on fields that they then have to spray with agricultural chemicals. We could be growing industrial hemp. We would reduce the weed pressure on those fields for subsequent crops and, uh, and we would be in a much better situation supplying fiber to our fiber needs. Another thing that interests me very much is using the hemp herds in particular for a building material because uh, when you make uh, the hemp for paper making, when you decorticate the fiber, because only about 30% of the uh, uh, hemp plant is fiber, every time you get one bag of fiber, you get two bags of herds. And uh, the best thing to do with that is to use it as a building material. Uh, I went to France and I saw what they're doing there um, with a uh, process which is actually very old. They uh, mix the hemp herds with lime and sand and a uh, small amount of water but the basic idea is the chemical combination between the lime, which is a calcium hydroxide, and the hemp herds with a high silica content, and uh, sand uh, really adds to the, to the strength of the mix, and uh, it's really easy to do. I think it really makes sense to build right on site. You build forms out of plywood, mix up the hemp herds and lime, and put it in place, and it takes a long time to set up, actually. It might be relatively firm enough to take the forms off overnight, but it takes several weeks to really uh, harden up, and it goes on hardening for years. In fact, the uh, Roman aqueducts were built on this process, and they were probably actually made for, with hemp and lime, and some of them are still carrying water today. Also, if you're building a wall with this process, um, the material itself is the wall. You don't need any interior wall, you don't need an exterior wall, and you don't need insulation. Uh, the, it's a one-step uh, process. Um, well, you can add a finish uh, over the top, a lime, lime and sand to make it a smooth top coat, but otherwise, uh, the basic material provides the whole wall. This is a fossil. It's uh, organic matter that's been mineralized into stone over a period of hundreds of thousands or even millions of years to become hard as stone. This is isochambra, a new process that takes hemp and converts it into a mineral form similar to a fossil and petrifies it in a matter of a few hours to become a hard building material. The fossils of the future and the building material of tomorrow. The hemp house is a must-see because it blow it, it once you can envision the future, then you can make it possible. And when people see that, they're going to suddenly just go and say, yes, I see the future, I get it. And this should be shown all over the world because then you don't have to even say anything. That's how amazing this hemp house is. It, has the, it creates an atmosphere, a world, a reality. The inspiration to make the hemp house probably started when, well, I'm an organic farmer and I love plants. I'm fascinated by how humans interact with plants and after reading Jack Herer's book, Vampire Wears No Clothes, talking about many details of the hemp plant, uh, I felt inspired to explore uh, what can be done in as far as building materials goes and so I started researching what uh, products are already available and then I did some exploring with the hemp oil and the hemp toe which is the uh, from the stock of the hemp plant and it's a soft cotton like material that uh, can be made into many forms and uh, I boiled the hemp oil for 10 minutes and put that on the hemp toe and realized that this is waterproof this holds water so on a global level the, the implications of this uh, go really far because 
waterproofing for our houses and for vessels and boots and raincoats and many things that we use every day are, uh, they all can be made out of hemp. It's non-toxic, no chemicals were needed. Uh, there really aren't any pests to hemp. That's another reason why this plant is so crucial to our very fragile poor planet right now that it has so many dying and dead rivers and you know, such a lack of oxygen and the climate is changing. The hemp plant can, within a, a very short period of time, reverse a lot of our problems because, and re-put oxygen back in, in our air because it's an annual, the hemp plant grows in less than four months, 110 days. Uh, it can be 20 feet tall, and this puts a lot of oxygen back in our planet. This is, and then when uh, the harvest is reaped, and then you truck load the uh, plant stocks to the factories, and then a lot of useful items could be made. And here we have the hemp angel, 100% hemp angel, to thank for this wonderful plant. I'm Jake Graves, a sixth generation farmer in Kentucky. My son's the seventh, my grandson's the eighth. Every one of them, including me, have been able to raise hemp. My son's king. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather. Since 1607, I've been able to raise hemp out of when they settled in Jamestown. It's a mystery to me why a product that will feed, clothe, and shelter a human being is not available for use of anybody who wants to use it. We've been working now about five years intensely trying to bring to the American public the truth about this plant. It's no more complex than whiskey is made of corn, but we don't condemn the corn plant. Hopefully legislators will, uh, will realize that it's the rope and not the dope. The only reason that hemp and marijuana are lumped together is because the government has lumped them together. Otherwise, the two crops are really quite distinct. It's really rather like uh, sweet corn and field corn. People recognize the functional difference between them. People do not eat field corn. They enjoy sweet corn. If the grocer attempted to sell them field corn, they'd be rather upset about it. A uh, similar situation uh, with industrial hemp. Hemp is not a, a hallucinogen. Even though it smells like uh, marijuana and it looks like marijuana, uh, it's not marijuana because um, these strains have no or very little tetrahydrocannabinoid delta-9. Hemp is just booming, let me tell you. I've seen it grow. Um, we have researchers, we have publishers that publish magazines about hemp. We have uh, publishers who publish books. Uh, you can find out all you need to know from these people. We've got manufacturers, wholesalers, distributors, retailers, and others. Restaurants that serve hemp foods, and people that just want to get involved in the industry. So we're really the trade group for hemp and uh, we just see it's going to be great for our country. Uh, the reasons are numerous. Uh, the environment is number one, of course. I got into it myself because uh, I wanted to save the planet, and this is one way you can do it. Hemp, the final frontier. Check this out. Rock hard. Okay, what we have here are some hemp fiber reinforced plastics. This is a uh, replacement for fiberglass and we're using epoxy as the matrix material. However, I know it's possible to use hemp oil as a basis for the epoxies and thermoplastics. I've found that the hemp fiber is an amazingly strong and amazingly durable uh, fiber. It, it blows away fiberglass and is at the level of Kevlar and carbon fiber for its strength and, and stiffness. Just bashing the stuff around can really give you a sense of how tough this material is. It, the uh, material can be used, of course, to replace fiberglass, which is used in uh, bathroom shower enclosures with a chopper gun. 
you can build boats out of it, you could build just about anything that you can build with fiberglass or, or uh, thermoplastics. So I'm very impressed with the toughness of the fiber. It tends to, to hang together and be somewhat resistant to ballistic impact. In fact, I think this panel here is literally bulletproof for a 38 uh, bullet. And this is a bicycle frame that I built for the Hemp Expo to sh demonstrate the strength and, and structural qualities of hemp fiber when used as part of a bike frame. The bamboo is also a natural material for using a bike frame. It's a wonderful tube, very light, very strong, and the hemp fiber is a wonderful material to tie these, the bamboo tubes together. This bicycle weighs about 25 pounds. The frame alone weighs 4 pounds, which is a little lighter than the usual steel frame. The uh, bike is designed as a hybrid commuter type bike for replacing a car. Strong stuff. The, the hemp fiber is a bast fiber. A bast fiber is a fiber that's found in the stalk of the plant. Uh, the fiber is on the outside uh, in the bark and inside is what we call the herds and this is the woody core of the hemp plant. Now to get the fiber you have to separate the, uh, uh, the fiber from the woody core and this is done through a series of steps uh, that usually consist of a redding process and then a decortication process. The redding is the microbial breakdown of the glues that bind the fiber to the stalk or to the, to the uh, inner part of the stalk. Decortication is a process of separating then the herds from the fiber and this is a, can be uh, broken down into a series of stages where the uh, stalks first come into the mill, they run through uh, a machine which breaks the stalk, the, the uh, herds are then combed out, it then goes on to a process called hackling where they're further combed and further refined, the longer fibers are separated from the shorter fibers and they go to various uses. Some of that can be to textile uses or cordage uses or, or uses such as insulation. The herds then have a number of uses. They have a content of cellulose so that they can be used as a source of cellulose. They can also be used in building materials. They can be used as a fuel source as they were traditionally in the mills to warm the, the drying tunnels where the, which the stalks went through as they came into the mill. Any of the textiles, hemp textiles that are sold in the United States now, as you know, uh, are manufactured from fiber, yarn and fabric that's produced either in Eastern Europe or in China. And in order to use European or Canadian fiber for textile applications, there is a gap that we need to plug somehow, which is taking the relatively coarse fiber that's being produced in the West and turn this into something that's more like cotton, such it can be spun on cotton equipment. What we do is, in Romania, we weave fabrics and uh, have cordage made and um, we uh, finish our fabrics and have a cut and sew. It's just really amazing what it takes to get a stock like this into something like a cotton ball that you can, you can spin up. What you're really going for is uh, the gold, basically the, you know, the highest grade line fiber. And once you go through all these sorting uh, procedures, you know, the, the primary processing procedures with the redding and then the scutching which kind of slams the stalks open and strips them clean, and then uh, the hackling process which is, which is really involved and has several stages to that. You can get to the sliver and it's a clean kind of uh, fluffy fiber. Um, then you can spin it and the, the technologies for spinning are similar to flax and uh, that's one thing that, that in the West can be adapted.
Here's a fiber that if properly spun into yarn and properly woven or knitted in proper finishing, one can literally almost shatter the yarn or the fiber structure to make it even thinner and finer, which means that theoretically you could work with, say, a uh, hemp canvas and then end up with something that's very much like um, a hemp blanket cloth, very soft and smooth. It's a very unique fiber. It, it's, it's really been underdeveloped, mainly because it hasn't been in existence for we in textiles to play with. Oh, I guess the best word to say, to bring it into the 21st century is something that is rather unique as a natural fiber. Uh, it's unfortunate that cotton uses as many deadly chemicals as it does to be able to give the consumer what the consumer is looking for in wear and uh, care. Hemp can do the same thing at this point without all of that extra added chemistry. Uh, it's just that we have to be in the position to have the fabric. When hemp is properly grown and redded and done in the United States, I would say that the cost of hemp as compared to other fibers would bring hemp in at slightly more than cotton and slightly less than flax, flax being the fiber name of linen. That, um, but the main thing is for us to be able to grow it. Uh, we're lagging behind uh, and we're watching Canada and England and France and Italy and Germany all playing with this fiber, which is no longer illegal to grow. In the United States, the DEA refuses to admit the fact that there is a difference between the marijuana hemp and the industrial hemp. It's imported from China. It's a real basic lightweight hemp that um, softens up real nicely and it's wonderful to wear. The hemp fibers are like a shaft. They're hollow inside so um, it's not like cotton that'll wick the moisture away and hold it on your body. And even if your clothes are wet, it's not stuffy. It's a wonderful feeling. <laughs> It's a growing industry. It's future fiber, and people are starting to really uh, notice the, recognize the benefits of, of this miracle plant. I was at a trade show in Las Vegas called Magic, and um, I was working for my family business, which is an outerwear company, and we were showing there, and a friend of mine came to me with a hemp hat and said, check this out. And I looked at it and I saw the hemp label and I said, no, you can't do something with hemp. That, it's, no, it's true. Where does it come from? China. Uh, the wheel started spinning in my head. I write then. I was on my way to, on a buying trip to China right after Magic. I went there, I spent a month searching for hemp. Finally, at like the last day, we actually found it. Every country in the world is gonna be growing hemp before the United States does, I'm sure, because we have freedom here, so. <laughs> Um, because Dongping Hand Textile, first of all, has the is the largest hand fabric manufacturer in China, and um, since U.S. has the largest hemp um, hemp and cotton market, and so therefore we decided to come here and promoting it and to to make more uh, fat manufacturers of jeans to use more um, hemp and cotton blended inter intersected fabric to make it more because uh, hemp so far is um, 
not as popular as cotton, but we be believe the hemp's um, the quality of the hemp clothing, um, the fabric, and the comfort it brings is a lot more superior. So. Mine is really a substitute for plastic and rotting cotton because hemp is naturally mold and mildew resistant. That's great. So they're not only beautiful, but they're really functional. They're long wearing. They feel great. They make wonderful bed linens. Because hemp is so durable, it just makes superior products for most housewares. I make this hammock in China for now, but eventually I would love to make them in Brazil when we legalize hemp in my country but I have to wait for America to legalize it first because you know like third world countries like mine we follow America unfortunately. How are you doing today? Basically our, our family has been involved all the time with hemp and flax also called linen growing and that was our mainstay for, for centuries. We've been supplying all kind of people and also at the present we have a, a large interest over uh, in, in Hungary and um, we be able to, to grow a fairly decent size of hemp plot now. And we're hoping uh, that in the future we're going to establish the same business in Canada. I'm, I'm presently consulting a large Canadian hemp grower in Canada. And um, eventually we're going to have uh, the same technology and the same uh, expertise transferred uh, to North America. It's one of the most absorbing of all fibers. It's not attacked by any of the germs or such mildew that attacks cotton. Uh, it's not affected by the ultraviolet rays. So that, that's why it became a prime item for sales of the sailing ship. We're really excited about working with organic fiber in Canada. And I think it's essential that we, we focus on the organics because this plant is, is uh, the way to go and uh, the durability factor with antimicrobial properties, especially in footwear, um, or foot sock line, um, garments, knit garments. People really like the feel of organic fibers. This is new. Uh it's a knit, 95% uh, hemp, 5% lycra, which creates uh, a beautiful uh, stretch to the fabric. It allows hemp to be now used in many, many more hundreds of applications in clothing. It's all about style here at Crop Circle Clothing. I think for the whole hemp industry, we've got to move uh, more into stylish clothing, high quality clothing, and push it into the mainstream. Boom. Oh. It really tickled my fancy, to be honest, to get involved with this fabric because there was no information about it, how it needed to be constructed, how it needed to be dyed, what it needed to be made into. So to me, the whole research and development aspect was what really got me interested in dealing with that very old but brand new fabric, if you will. And I think we really have overcome a lot of obstacles to get to where we are going today. At the time when I joined Truthster Dog, there was no hemp fashion on the market. We decided we're going to take this environmental fabric and we're going to make very fashion-forward driven garments. And we wanted to make a statement with that. And in order to compete, you have to be as good as anybody else out there that makes conventional clothes. I think it's wonderful because as of recently, uh, you see a lot of mainstream um, customers that are interested in hemp and when I say mainstream you have majors like Nordstrom we do sell to Nordstrom catalog uh, we do a lot of catalog business there are other big name designers that have looked into using hemp that are using hemp currently and I think that is really encouraging for all the uh, small people that actually have started this big movement and uh, look where we're going with this you know there is a lot of awareness going out I want to feel good about what I'm doing and I feel good about what I'm doing every single day and seeing the, the growth and the opportunities that are, that are coming from, from what was an idea six or seven years ago. I think one of the biggest obstacles that we've run into uh, manufacturing domestically is that of our competitors overseas. If somebody here is making ten dollars an hour, that same job overseas, would, that person would be getting paid fifty cents a day. 
and that's what we're competing against here. Um, our workers are all insured. There's no health insurance overseas. So when you start weighing in all of those factors, it's very difficult to compete with that. But what we have found, we have created a niche, and in that niche we have found a customer that is willing to pay that extra price for what we have to offer. The slogan for the magazine is Saving the Planet in Style, because we decided that the marketing of this eco-friendly fiber would benefit from a style component. People didn't have to compromise about the way they looked to buy a better, better kind of good, better for the planet. The changes we have seen in three years since we started, it's almost unrecognizable. Uh, we've seen uh, an industry be born and start to walk like a small child, and we anticipate very soon it'll be running. It'll be running in several directions, fiber, food, and body products. People say hemp is the fiber of the future and so forth. Right now, hemp is business and hemp is money now. We can only dream about the money we can make when we're allowed to actually grow it here and have a supply. Basically, Hemp World and Hemp Pages helps people connect uh, to each other and um, to sell the hemp products that they're making and to learn how to make hemp products. And, um, it's basically an industry publication. Um, Canada is growing this year, so we're going to be importing their fiber and oil, uh, which is a great thing because it's you know, it'll be fresher and there will be less shipping costs. There's just more new product development all the time. There's a lot of great hemp beers out on the market, which I'm excited about. And um, basically, I'm just waiting for someone to invent a hemp tampon. <laughs> the hemp industrial end, for it to be outlawed or to have restrictions on it of any kind, is like condemning the earth to, to ecological disaster. Only hemp can make all the paper for the humans on earth, all the fiber for the humans on earth if necessary, all the um, uh, proteins that we would need. It's the best protein of all the things in nature. It's the, got the most protein of all the foods in nature. It's the healthiest thing that there is on earth to eat of the oil and of the seed. And a three and a half million plants, when you say it's the healthiest, that means overall that this is the most important single food source on earth and it's outlawed. It all begins with the seed. The seed contains the widest spectrum of essential fatty acids which are critical to all cell functions. They help digest fats, thereby lowering cholesterol. Essential fatty acids are called essential because of the simple reason that your body does not manufacture them. You have to eat them. What essential fatty acids do is virtually everything in the body involves essential fatty acids. Uh, hormone production, wound healing, cell growth, cell division, uh, um, uh, vitamin metabolism. They are literally the building blocks of life. And one of the problems with a lower fat diet that the Americans seem to, to to strive for these days is that you're not getting those essential fatty acids. So the less fat you eat, the more you need to eat the right fat, the good fat, and that's where hemp oil comes in. It's the best fat to eat of all of them. It's a good butter substitute, as well as a salad dressing, a spread, a topping, and a dip. By the way, can you imagine making ice cream with it? It's a great way to end world starvation. Uh, get great food into our diet. It's just so very important. Right now I've made some ice cream. Nutritionally it's amazing. You know, one of the building blocks of life, building your immune system so incredibly, lets your cells communicate to fight off viruses and all that. But then also, I'll tell you, you know, you think of this just as, um, as a survival plant, for a basic survival plant. Let's say you take two dozen hemp seeds, you put them in the ground, give each one a lot of room to grow, so they'll grow like into big Christmas trees, and then they all just fill with seed, let them grow big and strong, let them do their natural cycle, let them just fill with seed. 
So all of the branches and buds just bud out with massive amounts of seed. And right there, there's your protein. I mean, especially for, uh, for you know, for, for primitive people all over the world. For them to grow their protein, to be self-sufficient, it is so important. I could make a lot of money just, just putting hemp wine on my label, throwing a little bit of my oil in there, shaking it up and selling it. But we want something that, that people are going to want to have on their tables and, and to go along with their food and that they actually enjoy it, and, and something that, that's a quality product. So not only are you getting real good vitamins and proteins, but you get a lot of good energy, and that's all important. So get off that coffee and caffeine and join the hemp crowd. Enjoy my sodas. Hemp nut is shelled hemp seed, also known as dehulled or hulled hemp seed. It's 36% uh, essential fatty acids, 31% protein. It's 40% more nutritious than even whole hemp seed because you get rid of the cellulose in the shell thereby increasing the amount of nutrients. can be used in any recipe. Literally, I haven't found a recipe or formula or application yet that you can't use it in. It tastes like pine nuts or sunflower seeds. It looks like sesame. It, to me, is really the, the soybean of the next millennium. After the oil is pressed, we're left with a seed cake. This seed cake can be made into a fine flour which can then be made into a wide variety of products. It contains 30% protein and about 22% fiber. The hummus is made with uh, hemp nut butter and hemp oil. The tabbouleh is made with hemp oil. Um, the tahini dressing that goes in it is also made with the, um, the hemp nut butter. The only thing that we cook with is the hemp flour. And with that we make uh, a variety of different things. We make gra mostly gravies and sauces. And, uh, and of course pizza crust and uh, bread dough. Uh, pasta primavera that's made with a, uh, with a vegan hemp uh, vegetable sauce. And then we, spur we squirt a, uh, a vegan uh, hemp pesto over the top of that. This is hemp shepherd's pie. It's tempeh made with uh, hemp gravy and um, organic corn and uh, the mashed potatoes on top also are made with hemp oil. The hemp shepherd's pie is really, really good. It tastes really great. We make hemp pretzels. They're made from the hemp seed plant. The flour is uh, over 10%. We hand roll it and hearth bake it in Pennsylvania, in the snack food capital of the country, and also the home of the American pretzel. I started this in 1997 as a small fundraiser for my son's school and it was about sharing and caring for the community and it's gone on through the products. A portion of uh, all the profits made for Humboldt Hemp Foods goes to saving ancient forests. That's so important. Our coffee has whole hemp seed in it and our cake mixes we switched from ground hemp seed flour to uh, hold hemp seed now and it seems to be much creamier. The business is phenomenal. People are very excited about the prospects of hemp foods uh, along the eastern seaboard. They're traveling anywhere from Florida, Virginia, Maryland, uh, Boston, all the way up the coast, Canada, uh, because they've discovered that we are using uh, the hemp seed oil and seed and nut and various applications from baking into mainstay items on the menu. So it's doing very, very well. And what people don't realize is the U.S. food industry is about 50 times larger than both paper and textiles put together. So as gray as it is in paper and as great as in textiles, multiply that by 50 and you get an idea of, of what the potential is for hemp seed and food in, in this country. 
my company is projecting that we expect over 50 companies to develop hemp food products um, in the coming year. And this could be a major player in the natural food industry um, with the seed. And the leftover stock from, from growing the seed can be used in paper, plastics, and even automobile parts. These essential fatty acids are emerging in the cosmetic industry, in lip balms, soaps, shampoo, aromatherapy products, and creams. Hemp seed oil for the skin is very softening to the skin since it's high in essential fatty acids. It's very nourishing to the skin. These are pure essential oils, which means they come from the immune system of the plant and they help kill germs. They're antibacterial, fungicidal. They've been used as um, far back as at least 5,000 years for medicinal purposes, cosmetics. We love promoting hemp. It's just completely changed actually the direction of where Empress is going as a company in a very positive way. The uses for this soap are incredible, and they've been enhanced by hemp. But everything from curing uh, eye disease, I'd be in jail if we put on the label what people absolutely insisted did, curing warts, great for the skin, curing acne, and so on. So the number doesn't marry, matter. It's probably over 200 uses that I've received. I put out over 300,000 miles telling a story of our soap. I don't sell it. The soap sells itself. We have never had an ad, we have never had a salesman. And that's why, in one way, it's great for the hemp industry because they know we wouldn't do anything to damage a wonderful product. And all we're doing is making it better. We make handmade herbal soap, as you can see. Herbal in many ways, with hemp seed oil and three different healing herbs. It's wonderful soap. We uh, have very many satisfied customers. From the seed comes two oils the first pressed health and beauty oil, and the second pressed refined oil. Some applications are paints, dyes, detergent, fuels, and lubrication. The whole reason I got into candle making is because I wanted people to relax more. So putting it together with hemp made a lot of sense. So I'm hoping people will enjoy the light that I'm creating and relax. That's the idea. Basically our goal is to um, exchange information and help accelerate the re-commercialization of industrial hemp which is reoccurring here in North America and all over the world. When this is uh, harvested with a, a forage harvester and then spun into hemp logs, what the product is then is a, uh, a log that is clean burning that is 5% ash. So uh, when it burns, it only gives off uh, carbon dioxide. And when the plants grow in the field, they absorb the carbon dioxide and give off oxygen. One of the things with, uh, that's important to remember in agriculture is that a great deal of our food and fiber is being produced through the use of, of chemicals. Uh, literally uh, hundreds of millions of tons of chemicals are being applied in conventional agriculture to our ground uh, on a yearly basis. Uh, hemp becomes a, a, what we call a crop of transition where it allows a farmer to uh, make a, a change from conventional agriculture which uses a lot of chemicals to uh, organic farming. Uh, this period usually takes about three years and this is what we call transitional farming. And hemp becomes an excellent, uh, uh, an excellent crop in that. Right now, about 70% of the ozone depletion is directly attributable to nitrate fertilizers. And so the more ground that we convert to organic, um, the better it is for the planet. The other thing is that hemp uh, takes up a great deal of carbon dioxide, which gives uh, solutions to global warming. 
Um, we feel that uh, if we can eliminate uh, a lot of the poisons that we're putting into the atmosphere and into the ground, and certainly hemp can do that for us, uh, then we're bringing solutions to the planet that uh, a lot of people have been looking for for a long time. We can reverse some of the damage that's been going on. And hemp, uh, just from a fiber standpoint, means that we get to wear our carbon rather than, um, than actually have it floating around in the atmosphere. And of course, from a seed standpoint, it becomes an important food. And oil is one of the best oils from a cosmetic standpoint, allows your body to absorb it very nicely. And uh, so there's a lot of reasons that we like to see it in the organic rotation. We need more green plants on planet Earth to make the, the planet healthy, so we have good fresh air to breathe and uh, growing our own fuel is one way to accomplish that that can really solve a lot of problems but it would take a lot of money and a concerted effort on the part of everyone to get involved in this measure and because you have to have expensive power plants you have to have farmers willing to devote their their acreage to this experiment and you have to have a government that's willing to change the laws or allow just step to the side and listen to what the people have to say and allow the people to have the research done and their votes taken instead of this insane fever of fanatic prohibition when it, as it concerns the hemp plant. The United States is the only first world country on this dear planet Earth who is not planting industrial hemp. I mean, it is totally stupid. Yeah, my name is Bill Holmberg. I run uh, Global Biorefineries. We're the people that are interested in taking cellulosic biomass and converting it into a variety of fuels and chemicals and bioenergy. And this industry is just now moving into full force, and within a few years, we're going to need more biomass than we can get our hands on. And industrial hemp looks like a real candidate. We uh, import about 60% of our oil now in petroleum products from the Middle East. We have to turn that around. Uh, we only have 3% of the world's oil reserves, and we're using 25% of the current production. So those are figures that are just getting us in trouble, and we've got to find a way out of it. We think help can be, hemp can be helpful. Well, as you can see, hemp does matter. Hemp matters because it's one of the last healthy, sustainable, versatile crops we have left on this planet. Um, there's an amazing array of hemp things to be done and the quicker, sooner the better. There's a whole world of petrochemicals and lumber to be taken over. We need to stop the destruction as quick as possible. So um, keep your eyes out for hemp in the future because it's going to be everywhere. Uh, we need to help in every way to get those products moved into the American society. Uh, American people need to be comfortable. We need to help them to be comfortable with uh, hemp products to know that they're not a drug crop but that they are illegal. Uh, entity, they're a legal uh, product, and they should feel comfortable about helping their environment as a result of buying hemp products. And I think uh, within five years, uh, if we're lucky, the American farmer will be growing hemp in the United States again after a 65-year retirement program. Action begins with uh, education, when people know what the real story is and the whole picture, and they know, have the information so they can talk to others. They start talking and, you know, conversation by conversation this grassroots movement grows into an incredible you know expression of public will well, be sure and do your groundwork now get in contact know who your representatives are on the local level and the federal level and do your best to throw your your comments towards industrial hemp we want to uh, encourage everybody out there to first investigate it don't necessarily believe all the things you've heard about it check it out yourself educate yourself and I believe if you look at it in a reasonable attitude, you will come out in support of this country, the United States of America, growing hemp for its people, for its industry. We have a thirsty, thirsty, thirsty economy here that could use hemp, that can produce jobs, and create a lot of wonderful American products with American in ingenuity. Well, what you have here is a hemp teddy bear with movable parts and uh, made of a beautiful hemp. And he's kind of a vehicle for the message. The message is inside the hang tag, which is about awareness and spreading awareness. So um, the vehicle, the message, 
That's uh, an environmental message about uh, including hemp more into, uh, you know, sustainable living. You know, Aware Bear. It's a great name. Thanks. The Hemp Industries Association has a website that you can check out to see all of our members. Every member has a page. It's thehia.org. Uh, also, we have hempstores.com. Uh, we'd love all of you to go into a hemp store and touch it and feel it and see what it really is, how, how useful it is. And really, nothing else is going to uh, expand hemp other than your dollars saying, yay, buy hemp. <laughs>